Please turn with me now to Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, where we will read the first 11 verses. Philippians 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which in the, is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Thus far, the reading from God's word. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was January of the year 2009. I had been in ministry for only a year and a half. One of our dear brothers in the Reformed Church of Foxton, a 65-year-old man, had just passed away after a long period of suffering from cancer. And so it happened that I had to conduct my first funeral service. But at that time, the folks in Foxton did not yet have a big enough church to cater for large funerals. And this brother's funeral, it was going to be huge. And so we asked a neighboring church in Levin uh, whether we could use their big auditorium. This church was of another denomination, but their pastor was kind and agreed that we could hold the funeral service there. But, said he, because you are not familiar with our church's sound system, I will come and sit in the service and work the sound for you. So, a good plan, and we agreed. Well, on the day, the church was packed with people, churchgoers and non-churchgoers. And in my sermon, I thanked the Lord for the faith he had worked in our now deceased brother. And I preached the gospel, that is, that our Lord Jesus is the only way to the Father, the only way to heaven, 
and to eternal salvation. Well, when that service was over, the pastor came to me and said, you should not have done this. You should not have preached that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. You might have well have offended many people here today. My brother and sister, why am I sharing this with you? Well, to show you how different that pastor's message is to that of our text. You see, the main message of our text is that eternal salvation comes through believing in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. Not through any person else and not through self-wise human efforts. Now, someone might say, come on, pastor, we are Reformed Christians. We know salvation is only in and through Jesus Christ. So please don't preach to us. My answer would be, wait. Let's not get too comfortable with our current state of knowledge. After all, it's deeply entrenched in fallen man, even in the Christian, to put emphasis on human effort or on Christ and human effort together for our salvation. But our text warns against this. And here are the three points which our text gives to us. Firstly, not through human effort. Secondly, in Christ alone. Thirdly, by the Spirit. Firstly then, not through human effort. In verse 2, the Apostle Paul uses strong words. He warns the Philippians against false teachers. And he calls these false teachers dogs, evil workers, false circumcision. Some translations have rendered that last one as mutilators of the flesh. What is Paul on about? My brother and sister, he warns the young, vulnerable Philippian church against the so-called Judaizers. Who were the Judaizers? Well, they were Jewish Christians who made life hard for non-Jewish Christians, for Gentile Christians. In what way? Well, in that these Jewish Christians were telling the non-Jewish Christians that they could not be right with God by just believing in Jesus Christ that he forgave their sins. No, said these Judaizers, unless you also follow Jewish customs, you cannot be right with God. Perhaps you ask, but, but what Jewish customs? Well, Jewish ritual laws like celebrating Jewish feast days, sticking to Jewish food laws, and most of all, all males must be circumcised. See what these Judaizers were teaching? For all practical purposes, this is what they were saying. Hi, non-Jewish Christians. If you want to be right with God, you have to have Jesus and human effort. My brother and sister, in a way, you and I cannot blame those Judaizers for thinking this way. I mean, did not God once tell or told their, their ancestor Abraham that all males who belong to God's covenant people should be circumcised? Yes, did God not tell Abraham that every male who was not circumcised should be 
cut off from God's people? And did God not say that circumcision should be his covenant sign forever? Yes, God did say that. But what the Judaizers did not understand was that right in their lifetime, God's old covenant had just been swallowed up, just been overtaken and fulfilled by God's new covenant. And the old covenant sign of circumcision had just been fulfilled in the new covenant sign of baptism. Besides, even in old covenant times, it never was that outward circumcision itself would make anyone right with God. No, outward circumcision's task was only ever meant to be a sign, a sign that you belong to God's covenant people. And mere belonging to God's covenant people never meant that you were automatically right with God. After all, even in Old Testament times, those who were right with God were only those who had a change of heart. Who really loved God from the heart and believed in the power of the blood of the sacrifice. Look, is this not why God already in old covenant times often used to tell his people, it's not outward circumcision that makes you right with me. It's not a mere exercise of cutting away a piece of flesh from your body that will make you right and give you entrance to heaven. No. It is being cut in another place. It's being cut to the heart. It's a circumcision of the heart through which you will be acceptable in my sight. But those Judaizers did not want to listen. Therefore, Paul had to warn the Philippians like he had also warned the churches in Galatia, in Rome, and in Colossae. So no wonder in verse 3 of our text, Paul describes the Judaizers as people who put confidence in the flesh. What does putting confidence in the flesh mean? Well, it means to think that you can make yourself right with God through human effort. So seeing that those Judaizers just wouldn't listen, Paul got a holy anger against them and used the sharp words of verse 2 by calling them dogs, evil workers, false circumcision. Perhaps someone says, but but is it allowed to call people such names even though they are at fault and, and yes, even though they are stubborn? Well, John the Baptist did that when he called the Pharisees and Sadducees, you brood of vipers. And our Lord Jesus did it when he called the Pharisees and Lord teachers, you hypocrites. So now Paul uses similarly sharp words. I mean, the young Philippian church must be warned against such seriously false teaching. Someone might say, but, but pastor, we know we are only saved through faith in the Lord Jesus and not through human effort. So tell us, in what way does this text then apply to our lives? Well... How many of us can honestly say that we are not doing with the new covenant sign, with baptism, what the Judaizers did with the old covenant sign, with circumcision? I mean, is it not so 
that many Christians, perhaps even in our denomination, make the mistake of thinking that outward baptism, the outward sign of baptism, makes a person right with God. Some Christians in other denominations have even gone so far as to say that if you're not baptized with water, in fact, if you're not baptized with full immersion into water, then you're not right with God. See? See how sinful man is always bent on thinking it's Christ plus my human effort that saves me. It's Christ plus my baptism. Perhaps you say, but pastor, I don't sin in this way because I accepted all along that outward baptism does not make us right with God. Well, great. But how do you do with church membership? You know, it's easy to fall into the habit of thinking, well, I am right with God because I'm a member of this church and I faithfully attend church. And overall, I think I'm a good person. See? See the human effort sticking out its ugly head? Perhaps even to this application, someone will say, but pastor, that's not me. I know that although baptism and church membership are all good and God-ordained things, they cannot save me. I know that. Well, great. But what about this application? You see, there was once an elder a man who in his weekly job was a salesman. Well, as a salesman, he underwent a course in marketing skills. So, says this elder to his church's session, look guys, our church has not had much success with Christian outreach. If we could use the skills which I have just learned in this marketing course, we would communicate the gospel as clearly as possible to the greatest number of people. After all, says the elder, we could use the four basic principles of marketing skills that this textbook has taught me. They are product, place, promotion, and price. I mean, guys, we've got the greatest product to sell, the gospel of Christ. Let's get the place and the promotion, and let's give them the price. Wow, my brother and sister, of course, you and I are not against evangelism, but can the business of the church be shaped into the mold developed by a consumer-oriented society for selling its goods and services? After all, is not the goal of worldly marketing, uh, worldly marketing strategies to help businesses design products that people will buy and then to persuade the people to buy their products? And what happens if people don't see a need for that product? And that they cannot be persuaded to buy that product? Well, then the marketing team goes back to the drawing board and they decide that that product line be radically changed or its price reduced or that it be dropped altogether in favor of something more marketable. See the human effort? You see, my brother and sister, here is the bottom line. In the business world, 
The success of strategy is measured in terms of the response of the people. But you know what? Preaching Christ crucified. That is, as someone has said, a marketing strategist's nightmare. After all, here is the reality. Preaching Christ crucified is foolishness to some. It's a stumbling block to others. And you and I can't use human effort to try and make our gospel product more attractive for the buyers out there who don't see the need to buy Christ on his terms. See how human effort can even infiltrate the mind of a well-intending elder well, so far, we had the very long point one, through human effort. Here is a smaller point two, in Christ alone. In verse three, Paul says that those who belong to the true circumcision, the circumcision of the heart. Yes, those who are cut to the heart about their sins, they are the ones who only glory in Christ. They are the ones who, who boast in Jesus. They boast with him. They put their highest confidence in Jesus. And how could it be different? I mean, what room is there for boasting in human effort? After all, have we not just seen how no human effort can make us ever right with God? But happy and blessed the man or the woman. Happy and blessed the boy or girl who boasts in Christ. Who gives our Lord Jesus all the honor, the praise and the gratitude for making him or her right with God. And how happy was Paul. Indeed, how blessed that the risen Christ opened his eyes there on that road to Damascus. And from that moment on, Paul regarded all his prior human efforts as rubbish. Efforts which he once boasted in. As if they could make him right with God. Paul's circumcision, his nationhood, that he was an Israelite, that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, that he was a Pharisee with greater zeal than any other Pharisee. Yes, when Paul finally grasped who Jesus really is and what Jesus had done, that was the moment when Paul saw all his earlier achievements or what they were. As he calls it, fleshy. That means fallible human efforts. Nothing to boast in. And so, for the same reason by which Paul rejected his past human efforts, by that very same reason, Paul now wants the Philippians to reject the Judaizers. My brother and sister, by the same reason, should you and I now reject any notion, any idea of trying to score points with God through human effort. Yes, we want to please God, for he has saved us. We want to show him gratitude, but we are not going to try and earn our salvation and now, now that Paul is in Christ, what is his next desire? Well, twice in our text, Paul says that his desire is to know Christ. Remember how God once said to Jeremiah, there will come a time 
that I will make your heart of stone a heart of flesh. And then God says, and you will know me. What does knowing Jesus Christ mean here? Well, that Paul would not just believe that Christ is who he said he is. Because the, the demons knew who Jesus was. But that Paul would have all the three familiar components of a saving faith. That Paul would have the head knowledge. That he would give to that head knowledge assent, intellectual A-S-S-E-N-T, assent. Lastly, that he would also give reliance, that he will entrust himself to his Savior, Jesus Christ. What would leave that Paul with? Well, with not just feeling the wonderful presence of Christ all the time, and that's lovely, but that he would also obey Christ from the heart, just as our Lord once said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. How would Paul, how will you and I, my brother and sister, be able to have this fully committed walk with our Lord Jesus? Well, only if Paul, only if we, could receive from Christ an ever-increasing supply of the power, that same power of the resurrection, the same power by which he rose from the dead. This way, says Paul, would he be able to even go and suffer the hardship for Christ? Yes, share in Christ's sufferings. I mean, there where Paul was sitting and writing this very letter to the Philippians, he was already in prison. A few years later, he would be executed for his faith in Christ. But as Paul once said in Romans 8, we will be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his suffering. And indeed, by this resurrection power of Christ, Paul did run the race, and he did keep the faith. And so in Paul's death, he did become as desired, conformed to Christ's death. See Paul's relationship with Jesus? My brother and sister, if you and I could live and be that close to our Lord Jesus, then look what such relationship will also bless us with. It will be, as Paul says in verse 1, a safeguard for protecting us from ever again putting confidence in human effort for our salvation. Well, we have now seen two out of three characteristics of those who are true believers. Those who for their eternal salvation put no trust in human effort. Secondly, who glory in Christ. Here then, and last, is the small last point, the third characteristic, worshiping by the Spirit. In verse 3, Paul says, we are the true circumcision. We who worship in the Spirit of God. What does Paul mean? Well, remember that time just after Pentecost Day when Jewish Christians heard that a non-Jew, can you believe it, a non-Jew by the name of Cornelius, a Roman officer, had received Christ in faith? Remember how those Jewish Christians then reacted. At first, they seemed not happy with Peter that he had brought the gospel to Cornelius. This was what they said to Peter. 
you went into the house of uncircumcised men and you ate with them. See how these apostles and brothers reacted the same way as the Judaizers? Trusting in human effort, assuming that you cannot have Christ unless you have been circumcised, unless you're a Jew. What did Peter then tell them? Well, he said as much as, dear fellow apostles, dear men, do you remember what happened to us apostles there on Pentecost Day? Christ poured his Holy Spirit out on us. Well, when I, by God's instruction, went and brought the gospel to Cornelius' household, guess what? The same spirit fell on Cornelius and his household too. So, dear fellow apostles, see, see that what has happened with Cornelius' household, that was the Lord's doing. And see how even in their uncircumcision, see how in their lack of human effort, God brought these people to his kingdom. And then, well, when the brothers heard this, they had no further objections and they praised God saying, so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. So what do you and I see? Well, we see that the non-Jew, that Cornelius was made right with God without trusting on human effort, but by believing in Christ. The belief worked by the Holy Spirit. Dear Wainui member, even today, you and I are made right with God in the same way, by the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water, which is the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus continued, you must be born again. What does the Holy Spirit use, my brother and sister? What does the Holy Spirit use to work rebirth in our hearts? He uses the gospel, the preaching of God's word. Question, how often do you read the word of God? I pray that it's daily. For how else, how else? Will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? How else will the Holy Spirit work with you and me? Amen.